Good evening and welcome. My name is Chase Rend, and I have the pleasure of being the executive director here at the National Building Museum. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you for tonight's program. Now, as you, many of you know, the National Building Museum is America's foremost institution dedicated to educating the public about the world that we build for ourselves. Our award-winning exhibitions and educational programs showcase achievements in architecture, landscape architecture, urban planning, engineering, construction, and design. Now, looking around you tonight, you may have noticed that tonight's audience is slightly skewed to the younger side of the scale. So it's a good thing I'm here as a counterbalance. Um, but we have a younger crowd tonight because we are welcoming some 150 student delegates from across North America to the American Institute of Architecture Students Annual Grassroots Leadership Conference. And tonight's event is a part of that conference. This is our seventh collaboration with the AIAS in as many years, and I want to thank their interim director, Susan Zuber, for this continuing partnership. Each year at this conference, a new slate of AIAS officers is elected, so please join me in welcoming the new AIAS president, Tyler Ashworth, and vice president, Danielle McDonough, to the podium. Thank you, Chase. On behalf of more than 200 students from across the US and around the world who have gathered for the annual Grassroots Leadership Conference, I would like to share our gratitude for your continued support of the AIAS. Year after year, the National Building Museum opens its doors for student leaders for your Spotlight on Design lecture series. This event is one of many great ways to promote future leaders of architecture and design professions and complements our generosity, the generosity of our two mutual partners, the American Institute of Architects Lafarge, and Lafarge North America, whose support makes our programs possible. We look forward to tonight's keynote lecture and inspiring conference over the next several days. Thank you all. Thank you, Tyler and Danielle, and we congratulate both of you for your new positions. We also would like to extend our best wishes to the immediate past president, Janine Chastain, and Vice President Brett Roth. Could you please stand just to be recognized and congratulated for your work? There you are. Thank you. Now tonight's program is part of the museum's ongoing Spotlight on Design lecture series. This series features designers of distinction from around the world. Since 2001, Spotlight on Design has been generously sponsored by Lafarge, the world leader in construction materials. We are very appreciative of Lafarge's generous support, and we also receive additional support for this series from the American Institute of Architects, and we are, of course, grateful for their support as well. To say a few words about their organizations, please welcome George Miller, FAIA, President of AIA, who will be followed by Stephen DeMay, Lafarge Vice President of Sales for Gypsum. George? Thanks, Chase, and uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here. I, uh, I was with many of you at AIS Forum uh, in Minneapolis. Who was there? Wasn't it cold out there? And here we are in Washington, <laughs> you know, six months later, and boy, is it warm here, I can tell you. So we're covering both ends of the spectrum, but it's so nice to see so many of you uh, here, and I know you're gonna have a terrific time here in Washington, and you know, I don't really miss an opportunity to come over to this uh, wonderful space, and uh, it's really one of the grand spaces in, in Washington. And, and so we're really, um, I'm proud at the AIA to kind of co-sponsor uh, this evening. I mean, it really is a focus, an exceptional focus on, uh, on design, and this program is really a, a meaningful program where we can really all learn about uh, architecture, not only here in this country, but, uh, but from a, abroad. And, uh, you know, it, it's a great partnership that we really have with the National Building Museum. I mean, we've been working with uh, Chase and his team here for many, many years, and it is a really great, great partnership. Uh, and we, can, we, we are really proud to kind of support uh, everything that we can because this is really one of the major, major uh, opportunities for 
outreach and architecture and design and building in the nation. And uh, I urge all of you who aren't members to become members. That's a plug, Chase. Does that work? Yeah? <laughs> so uh, anyway, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm really delighted, of course, to welcome all of you from AIS. And, and I, I'm, I know that our uh, executive committee and members of our AIA board are going to join you in your barbecue over at AIA headquarters tomorrow night. So don't miss that. That'll be a lot of fun. And just to conclude, you know, this, this kind of focus on design is really an important, important kind of contribution. And one of the themes of my, uh, my leadership year at AIA has been kind of surrounding the whole notion that design matters. It, it matters really to each and every one of us. It matters whether we're working in a small firm, you know, doing kitchens and baths or exploring new materials, or whether we're working in a, a mid-sized firm, you know, doing schools uh, in, in a local area, or whether we're working, uh, you know, on the West Coast and projects that, uh, that are kind of being built in, in in faraway places in Asia and other, other places. It is the one thing that, that kind of ties each and every one of us together. I mean, architects, engineers, of course, I saw Zivon Cohen here tonight, and, and so many of our friends, it ties us all together. We are all interested in, in design. And, and I think um, my job really is to try to, again, focus on the importance of design, elevate the public's understanding of design and the contributions that architects can make to making our communities safer, healthier, and really more sustainable. So I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, this presentation this evening. Uh, it's our honor and pleasure to be here, and um, we look forward to kind of seeing you across town tomorrow and enjoy the evening. Thank you. Chase? Good evening. Lafarge participates in many national and international events with the objective of contributing to the discussions of urbanism, architecture, and sustainable development. We're especially proud to have worked with the National Building Museum as the corporate sponsor for the Spotlight on Design since 2001. Together, we've welcomed thousands of guests and many acclaimed architects and designers from around the world. Lafarge's partnership with the National Building Museum is one step in our ongoing effort to commit to work with architects and the community for their ambitious projects. We're looking for new solutions for construction and to reduce our ecological footprint in the manufacturing process as well as to develop a larger social role. We hope that together we can find innovative solutions to that process in the general project, I'm sorry, uh, in the general public, while also providing architects with the products that they need today. This evening, Lafarge would like to welcome Michelle Roken and Martin Felsen to the National Building Museum. And we'd like to thank the National Building Museum for all their work and support for Spotlight on Design. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, George. And now it is my pleasure to welcome tonight's speakers. Martin Felsen, AIA, received a Bachelor of Architecture from Virginia Tech in 1991 and a Master of Science in Advanced Architecture Design from the Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation at Columbia University in 1994. In 1999, Felsen co-founded Urban Lab with Sarah Dunn, an architecture and urbanism practice in Chicago, Illinois. In 2008, Felsen was appointed director of ArcaWorks, an interdisciplinary design school located in Chicago. Michel Roquind was born in Mexico City, where he studied architecture and urban planning at the Universidad Iberoamericana, graduating in 1994. After working on his own for several years, he teamed up with Isaac Broid and Mikel Adria to establish Adria Broid Roquind. In 2002, he founded Roquind Arquitectos, recognized in 2005 by Architectural Record Magazine as one of the 10 best design vanguard firms. This year, both studios were selected by the Architectural League of New York as two of their eight emerging voices, which is a very, very special honor. I am pleased to present both of these talented professionals to you this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our speakers. Okay, thanks so much. Um, thanks to the National Building Museum for having us. 
Um, thanks to um, Michelle for being here with me. Uh, it's a really great honor. Uh, I had the real pleasure of seeing Michelle talk a couple of months ago in Mexico City. And I really, uh, I knew his work before, but I really came away thinking he's one of the most energetic, uh, dynamic, and uh, sincere architects on the planet. And I'm looking forward to his talk also. Uh, and then everyone here, thanks for coming. And thanks to family and friends uh, for being here. Um, Sarah Dunn and I uh, rarely get to talk together at the same place at the same time. So we oftentimes flip a coin to see who's going to come. And I think that I won this one. Uh, we'll see. It's really a great uh, pleasure to be in this building, which I think is one of the great um, interior urban projects uh, in the United States. It's really, really inspiring. OK, so Sarah Dunn and I, uh, this is our diagram of who we are. We have Urban Lab there on the left. Uh, in the middle is our, our academic appointments. Um, I've been teaching at IIT for about 15 years now. Uh, Sarah at UIC for um, maybe about 10 years now. Uh, she just got tenured uh, this year. Um, and uh, both of those programs have very strong leaders. Uh, Mies, of course, uh, despite uh, having passed away about 30 years ago, is still very strong at IIT. Uh, and um, both Walter Nesh, as you can see from this building, uh, which is a very underappreciated architect, and Bob Zomel are very strong, is now very strong at UIC. And then ArchiWorks. Um, as was mentioned, we started uh, as co-directors at ArchiWorks a couple of years ago. Um, ArchiWorks uh, is around, was founded about 15 years ago to address uh, social and environmental justice issues related to urban design. Um, it's basically an alternative design school um, and has been, but what it will be uh, very shortly, maybe in the next year basically, is that it's going to become a think tank. Uh, think tanks, as you know, basically conduct research, uh, engage in advocacy, and there's really not many of them in the world that are devoted uh, to design, architecture, urbanism. Um, so we're going to be kind of trying to understand what an architecture think tank could be, and we're going to transform it uh, slowly but surely. And essentially what we're going to do is um, work with design and the idea of just inserting design into public policy to really steer uh, decisions that get made uh, uh, through cities, about cities, and work with a lot of um, municipal leaders. Um, all right, so I'm going to start with three principles or precepts about our work, um, mostly related to infrastructure. Um, and uh, I, I'm kind of focusing the talk uh, with a little bit of an understanding of what Michelle is going to talk about. Um, so trying to show a couple of different um, ideas, hopefully, not overlap too much. Um, but also, in, we're interested in infrastructure because we all collectively own it. Um, a city like uh, D.C., Washington, most of what we see out there, we collectively own. Uh, and so the question is, if we collectively own it, what do we want to do with it? Uh, you know, and so... The first couple of principles deal with this, with this kind of concept. The first is leverage. Um, and by leveraging, I mean leveraging infrastructure to create new types of public architecture. Um, in this slide, basically, uh, is a project that we did for the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. And what we're trying to do here is rethink the infrastructural pedestal. You can see that kind of flat, empty zone on the, on the before slide that was left over by an architect who I, who I think did a very poor job of connecting the building to the city. Um, and what we're doing is trying to essentially flood the pedestal with public program to make that space a public space. Uh, the second concept, it's a little bit hard to see there, is hybridity. Um, and the idea here is to rethink infrastructure as new assemblages um, of the same stuff but organized in new multifunctional ways. Uh, and also to connect uh, a number of social and political, political agendas with design agendas. So on the slide, we can see uh, an interest. This is Cleveland, uh, working with some um, municipal officials in Cleveland to really think about um, this relationship with design and policy related to urban agriculture, uh, local energy, um, recycling, community-owned and operated and managed microparks, and the idea of architecture as this um, thick, uh, mat or thick landscape that really brings it all together in a highly dense hybrid way uh, that takes advantage, advantages of piling resources on top of themselves 
to get as much as possible out of limited uh, dollars, limited amount of material to save material, to save energy, and all, all sorts of those ideas. Uh, the third concept or precept, I guess, is this idea of 40%. Uh, this is a, a picture of Chicago. Um, looking at all of the land at Chicago, uh, all 40% of that land is infrastructure. Um, and again, it's areas that we collectively own. It, and it basically, I think, are, they are sites of leverage for architects. They are areas that architects should really be looking a little bit more closely at. And um, it's really terrain that architects need to attend to. We can't just kind of leave it and leave it for somebody else. We can't just kind of operate on the, within the boundaries of uh, properties that our clients own. And then this fourth idea, uh, which is just really the site at which I'm going to uh, talk to tonight, uh, the infrastructure of water. Um, and it's really looking and thinking about water as a uh, precursor to, an al to a series of alternative design proposals that are based upon ecological principles as well as uh, cultural, political, economic facts on the ground. Um, so some quick facts about uh, the Great Lakes Basin where some of these projects will take place. Um, first of all, uh, the Great Lakes Basin, if it were sort of plucked out of the United States, it would have the third largest economy in the world. Um, it's an economic juggernaut of uh, extreme proportions that's really all based upon the idea of water as infrastructure that created it and that keeps it going. There's also this fact that the United Nations is predicting that uh, in 2025, two out of three people in the world will be facing water shortages, and that global conflict will inevitably result in these, in these shortages. Uh, when we look around the world, we can see the world water availability is in, uh, directly related to uh, surging population growth and related to um, a kind of lack of resources in those areas. Uh, and even in our own country, we can imagine uh, what water conflict will be like. This map was generated, generated by the Environmental Protection Agency, um, really predicting that in a very short number of years, 2025, these areas of the United States will, will, will start to basically run out of water. Uh, for the first time in, uh, uh, in the kind of the history of building cities, we're building cities without uh, adequate natural resources or kind of looking forward uh, to sustainable to the sustainable design of cities, and um, it's going to just get more and more obvious of what's uh, of the problems. Um, one of the problems is that we don't reuse water. Uh, in Los Angeles, for instance, it's predicted that if uh, people in Los Angeles would collect rainwater, they would essentially have half of what they need all year. Um, instead of that, basically, Los Angeles spends billions of dollars per year on moving water, uh, fresh water around the country, essentially, to uh, satisfy their necessities. Um, you know, that billions of dollars, which could easily go to something else uh, in support of, uh, I mean, I think architecture, but uh, of so many other things. Um, in other cities, there are these things called combined sewers, and essentially we combine uh, sewer water, sewage, with rainwater. Rainwater is perfectly clean. It could be used for any number of things, and we just kind of combine it together. Uh, the other thing that happens when we combine uh, rainwater with sewer water is that we get these enormous um, uh, uh, combined sewer overflows, essentially. Um, and in New York, for instance, it results in uh, every 25th flush that one would make, that water, that black water goes right into uh, one of the harbors in New York City. So, the, so this first project that I'm going to show is about uh, this idea of decoupling. Uh, decoupling uh, rainwater from uh, black and gray water in order to, uh, I hope, uh, show a kind of demonstration of how we could radically change a city uh, just by paying attention to some of the ecological functions that lead to uh, much higher degrees of sustainability uh, for the city itself. Uh, this is uh, the project in a nutshell. Basically, it's um, thinking about Chicago, the city of Chicago, um, as a model city for what we're calling growing clean water. Uh, here's Chicago, for those who aren't too familiar with it. Um, it basically looks like this, where the red, um, the red, the kind of higher intensity red parts, show it better here, um, are the areas of highest density. Um, and the line, the white line that you can see there, is 
uh, the Chicago Central, but the city of Chicago, the rest is the kind of sprawling uh, parts of Chicago. Uh, a lot of the Midwestern cities um, don't gain population. In fact, they're shrinking, but double the amount of land that they use every 10 years or so because of sprawl. And then we can look at it in relationship to some of the other cities uh, relative to, uh, to density, and we can kind of see in a snapshot where people are, where the cities are relative to different types of, uh, different types of density and how people are living. Okay, so some other quick facts, just so you get a real sense of, of the project. 20% um, of the Earth's fresh surface water is on deposit in the Great Lakes. 95% uh, of the United States fresh water uh, somehow emanates first from the Great Lakes system. Uh, Chicago removes over a billion gallons a day of Lake Michigan water, and we renew less than 1% of that. So a less than 1% renewal rate is equivalent to the worst desert that you can imagine. Even the worst desert somehow does a little bit better than less than 1%. So we're really not doing a good job in that sense. And what we essentially are doing is creating this diagram where we take out of Lake Michigan this billion gallons a day uh, and send it, well, first send it into the city and then on to the Gulf of Mexico. This was basically, in, this was the great idea of the 1960s and 70s that architects didn't have anything to do with because we didn't have anything to say about it in the 60s and 70s. Uh, when it gets down to the Mississippi, we can, this is a NASA satellite before this oil spill, uh, where this red and uh, yellow uh, points are the, this uh, so-called dead zone, where there's too many nutrients, not enough air in the water, uh, lots of invasive species and other sorts of uh, problems that prevent life from actually, uh, for anything from living uh, very, very comfortably in these areas. And Chicago is doing a, a, a great deal to this. One note on the um, vulnerability of natural resources. And again, uh, I think we see it every day in the news in the Gulf, but um, uh, thinking about the lake systems and water systems, if we look at number four here, the Aral Sea, um, we see that in 1960, it was the third, uh, fourth largest inland body of water. Um, because of basic uh, policies that, were, that favor uh, agriculture-based economy uh, over water-based economy, this is what has been going on to the Aral Sea uh, in, the last, uh, in the last few decades. And we can see that as it kind of shrinks down, um, that the, micro the microecology is just disappearing. Uh, what kind of lets, what, what gets left behind when a microecology gets destroyed is always desert for the most part. And we can see that, you know, even since 1989, uh, the Aral Sea has basically disappeared. What's left is uh, highly polluted, kind of toxic water that is really not useful to anything. Uh, to get the Aral Sea back to its normal condition is nearly impossible. Uh, you know, once we destroy something, it's pretty much gone. Uh, at least over generations or and trillions of dollars. So I think that what we do collectively is we look at huge uh, resources and think they're, in, they're invulnerable to anything that we could do. Uh, and we set these kind of policies and think about the, and think, come up with design guidelines and frameworks that don't really understand the, the, the vulnerability of these things. And I think we really have to think about it in relationship to some of these larger case studies. A couple of other quick facts, just so you can understand this project a little bit better. Um, Chicago is on a subcontinental divide. Uh, that means that every little drop of water that basically gets poured onto um, the Mississippi watershed side, want, if it infiltrates into the ground, will flow toward the Mississippi naturally via gravity. Uh, putting water onto the other side of the continental divide, all the water flows toward Lake Michigan. Um, in uh, about 100 years ago, uh, Chicago reversed the flow of its river uh, for good reason, for sanitary reasons, uh, because the river once flowed into the lake uh, and because Chicago essentially deposited their sewage into that river, it went right into where we're, the drinking water, so they reversed it. But what happened was that um, uh, when we added this idea of the combined sewer is that now what we do is we capture all of the water in Chicago, uh, sewer water, gray water, green water, blue water, rain water, and we push it and we collect it into this deep tunnel system, just these giant uh, thermoses of water. 
and we put it onto the other side of the subcontinental divide and send it down into the Mississippi. Um, so we have kind of engineered our city, and this is true of many, many cities um, across the United States and world now, um, that we are engineering our cities to lose resources, especially highly valuable resources, rather than to protect them and, and, and grow them, recycle them. Uh, the other thing about, uh, this is the um, uh, sewer treatment plant that exists in this little, um, let me try to point it out here. Okay, here we go. See that little dot right there? Okay, that's at the end of the deep tunnel system, which is one of the world's great engineering feats even today, according to some, is this, the, uh, the wastewater treatment plant. Um, in addition to this kind of water problem, this is the largest, this has the largest carbon footprint in Illinois. And in every single state in the country, the biggest carbon footprint uh, of any state is the water system. In California, 20% uh, of all of the energy spent publicly is spent moving water around the state, uh, which again equates to just so much dollars and uh, releases so many carbon gases into the, into the, uh, into the atmosphere. Okay, to the proposal. Um, so in 2106, that's a play on 2016, uh, Chicago's Olympic bid. Uh, I'll show you a couple of slides on that in a minute. But uh, the proposal here is to uh, turn Chicago into a, a model city for growing clean water. The, the design part of the proposal essentially is to create uh, what we call eco boulevards that stretch from the subcontinental divide to the lake. Um, because this, from the subcontinental divide to the lake is already pitched naturally, uh, water, any water in that zone will just naturally move back or try to move back to the lake. Um, and what these eco boulevards do is essentially connect first all of the other existing greenway and green infrastructure, parks, everything else that's in the city, and um, uh, uh, essentially try to pr uh, produce uh, in the city and in, uh, create for the city an entire kind of holistic living machine. Um, the eco boulevards are in the street only. No private property is theoretically used. And it's really just this redesigning the streets and the sidewalks and the alleys and other sorts of infrastructure to, to create this kind of large-scale living system. Um, here's a highly idealized version of what it might look like uh, and just sort of explaining it a little bit. Um, it's a combination of kind of everything one can think of that might be valuable in a city uh, to deal with a bunch of different types of infrastructure. First of all, there still is the street infrastructure, the, the normal moving cars and people around. Uh, there is the water-based green infrastructure. Essentially, you can see this uh, blue strip that's sort of allowing the water to be captured in the streets as it falls on the city. Um, there are public uh, uh, cultural spaces in addition to the ecological spaces. And there are these things in the middle called, uh, literally called living machines these devices here, that are um, uh, collecting gray water and processing gray water using a, a no energy, essentially, and taking advantage of biological processes. And I'll show some uh, further information on those in a minute. Uh, this is part of a two-minute movie. You can look at it on Vimeo if you uh, feel like it. So how does this eco boulevard system work? Um, first of all, uh, as, they, sorry, as they exist here, um, they would be theoretically, again, placed every uh, half mile to also pr uh, promote uh, a, a series of alternative uh, transportation systems, biking, of course, but also walking in a city that really not a lot of people walk in. Um, they take advantage of just nature itself as generating uh, the, uh, the means to clean water. And essentially, the goal is to uh, close the loop on this system that really just isn't working, uh, to essentially extract water, once it, water is extracted out, uh, to collect it either in uh, some sort of architecture that can process water, clean it, uh, through the infrastructure of the city itself, the Eco Boulevard, collecting rainwater along the way to help drive it, and then redeposit all of that water back into the lake. Um, so I'll show a couple of where this project is right now. Um, it's kind of went in two directions when we started working on it about three years ago. Um, so this is uh, uh, just a, a diagram showing, um, essentially, if this is a street, it's 31st Street in Chicago, but um, this is a kind of typical street in Chicago 
uh, that essentially um, is adjacent to lots of public parks, lots of schools. Uh, these um, uh, north-south vertical lines are public transportation. And the idea, again, in a kind of idealized version, is to take advantage of the existing uh, green infrastructure, existing parks, existing roadways, existing bike lanes. So uh, two directions is basically where the project went a couple of years ago, um, or a few years ago. One is um, by thinking about using the Olympics as a catalyst for developing the project uh, quickly. And so Chicago, as you might have known, uh, and spectacularly failed, to get the, um, uh, the Olympics uh, about a year ago. Um, the idea essentially was to look at all of the venues in the Olympics, all these little, that's what all the little dots are, um, and connect all the venues with Eco Boulevards. Uh, the Eco Boulevards would also connect the venues with public transportation and um, connect with the lakefront park. The Olympics, um, the mandate of the Olympics is that one isn't allowed to uh, design any parking into any venue. Uh, and the, any, every city has to count on as much public transportation as possible to get people around. Um, so the idea was to essentially set up uh, eco boulevards that terminate uh, with a living machine uh, on the lake. These living machines would essentially be uh, landmarks of each of the venues and would um, really talk about this idea of a blue games. Uh, every, I, you probably don't pay attention to this, but Every game has a color associated with it for the Olympics. So this was pr pr propositionally would be the blue games that really dealt with this kind of impending crisis of water uh, worldwide. And there were a lot of ideas that were promoted. Real quick about this uh, vertical greenhouse, this living machine. Uh, on the upper right there is a uh, existing living machine. It's technology that's been around for, uh, for quite a number of years. Um, basically those white kind of drums are called cells. Uh, each cell has a different micro, uh, micro ecosystem. So a meadow, uh, constructed wetland, and so forth. Uh, water, uh, any kind of wastewater, passes through each of these cells, and microbes and plants and fish and different things eat uh, what they want, essentially eat the nutrients that we don't want, uh, that we flush away. And the outcome of this is clean water at the end of the cycle. Um, so this um, living machine essentially would be created out of a bunch of these cells uh, that water just kind of go, runs down uh, through gravity, and we would double program these, again, this kind of hybrid idea of um, collecting some other program, public program, into each of the living machines, in this particular case, a uh, bike station. The second way that we're pursuing the project, because that one obviously is not happening, uh, unfortunately, is that we're working with the Chicago Department of Transportation. Um, when any of us look outside at our cities or our municipalities, we see roads. Every single road will be redeveloped, renovated, redone over a 30-year or so lifespan. So the idea simply is, why not come up with some kind of a toolbox that um, has a, a whole array of methodologies, design concepts, techniques, technologies, that when roadways are re redesigned and, and just renovated, that we put into place a series of green infrastructures that allow, uh, that basically change over the gray infrastructure systems to this green and blue infrastructure. So I'll, I'm very quickly just going to show a couple of examples of that. Um, these might be some, again, idealized versions of the relationship between these new roadways and uh, public and ecological program. Uh, and essentially, we can, uh, the most important thing to see here is that this is private property here, for instance. This is a private building here. It's really just this sidewalk and street uh, that, again, we all own. That is what, what we're talking about. In Chicago's case, about 66 feet in width. Um, so we created this um, uh, uh, toolbox, essentially, looking at these roads as a start. Um, we looked at best management practices, just existing examples uh, around the world to start with, known technology so that people weren't completely scared off uh, by the idea. Um, and we looked at it at different scales, of course. There's very micro scale to kind of bigger macro scale that's necessary. And when we look at one particular street, um, and I'm not going to go into detail, but basically what we did was we looked at what's there on the ground, facts on the ground. Here, is A Street, State Street in Chicago, this exists. Here's what the engineers wanted to do. Uh, 
So each of these projects were also had a little bit of engineering and design. And then here's what we wanted to do. And so we kind of try to, we're trying to make our case through existing uh, practices, conventional practices. And what we essentially develop at the end is this sectional difference. Uh, the section on the top is what a typical engineering, civil engineering, and even architecture uh, office might want to do. On the bottom is what we would propose. Uh, it's pretty subtle, doesn't take away any uh, traffic lanes at all. It really just tries to accept water uh, into a, uh, so we kind of go from a, this uh, geometry to this geometry in so many cases. And we try to plug in social program like a little micro pocket park uh, where we can. Okay. All right. So one thing that um, uh, when I was listening in the back to the uh, previous um, uh, conversation, there was a, somebody, said, somebody asked the question, how do they get involved uh, as an AIS, AIAS member? And the answer basically was, uh, as, even though you're a student, don't be afraid to take on uh, some level of responsibility and don't be afraid to kind of poke around where you otherwise might think you're not supposed to. Um, I think the same thing can just be applied to the profession, the discipline of architecture. Um, you know, architects don't typically take a proactive role in the municipal decision-making process of the, de of the bigger design of cities. Uh, you know, we wait around for commissions to come in, hopefully they do, and we kind of work on those to the best of our ability, obviously. Um, so that, the last project and this project are all about really trying to almost invent projects and then uh, work as hard as possible to try to implement them simply because we as architects think that this is the way that cities uh, could perform better, more sustainably, and uh, economically, uh, which is perhaps the most important characteristic of a project going forward or not going forward, uh, especially in the United States. Um, so this project started um, as an ideas competition. Um, and you can see on the lower right there, the WPA 2.0. Um, this is a project started by an uh, organization at UCLA called City Lab. And they basically just asked uh, anyone who wanted to participate to think about how infrastructure can change cities, uh, how infrastructure that's organized by architects and designed by architects could really have an influence uh, on cities, um, basically reasserting our role into the design process at a large scale. Um, so uh, our project tried to merge the um, ideas that were kind of being pushed forward by the U.S. Um, Recover and Reinvestment Act, this, the infrastructure stimulus package, uh, about a year ago. And um, the question that we really asked us, we asked ourselves first is, you know, all of the money being spent, uh, ostensibly for jobs and other things, is it a wise investment? Is it, gonna, uh, is, it an, is it actually an investment or is it just maintenance? maintenance of systems that we really don't even want in the first place. Maintenance that really is just going to push the uh, problem further to the next generation to deal with when resources will even be more limited in terms of uh, taking care of some of these infrastructural systems. Um, so um, so we then we asked ourselves, what is, uh, what is an infrastructure that can be catalytic? Uh, or stated more simply, what's an infrastructure that can encourage uh, alternative forms of architecture to exist and happen. Um, so we know what the most successful catalyst uh, of the 20th century and probably 21st century is, oil. Um, it's easily the world's most valuable resource. Um, our resident expert, um, uh, uh, Sarah's father, uh, Dorsey Dunn, gave us some statistics which are probably very conservative, and that is that oil accounts for over $3 trillion a year globally and 20 million jobs per year globally. Um, tomorrow, again, we're predicting that water will be the world's most valuable resource. Uh, basically, water will be the new oil. We really, truly believe that. And we, when we look at this map, what we see is a kind of Saudi Arabia of water. Uh, we see it as a kind of uh, island unto itself that uh, if it doesn't take care of its resource and doesn't find a way to uh, really leverage it for the economic benefit of us all, and that benefit being also related to a sustainability benefit, it's really going to be a problem. So um, what the Great Lakes have, again, water, what they don't have is jobs. Most of the Midwestern Rust Belt cities are losing jobs and therefore losing populations. What's left is a declining, huge, uh, very expensive uh, uh, urbanism to, uh, to try to maintain. It's just not sustainable at all. 
Um, what we have is a gray infrastructure. What we don't have is an infrastructure that supports our health, the health of the uh, city, the health of the environment, and, and so forth. So the proposal, essentially, is to create, uh, uh, to design a water-based infrastructure to not only attract water-intensive industries, jobs, and dollars, but to do it in a way that um, sustains the natural ecology of the system. Uh, the first thing we look at is uh, what water-intensive industries exist uh, out in the world. Here's a kind of short list of them, and we can see their water footprint uh, when we look closer. Um, you know, it just takes an enormous amount of water uh, to produce things. Um, uh, 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 an automobile takes somewhere in the neighborhood of 100,000 gallons of water uh, to create um, and so forth. A pair of jeans takes 2,900 gallons of water to make. So how do we attract them with this concept, which is a highly provocative, I know. Uh, I'll show you where this project is in a second, but uh, this idea of free water. So what about the idea of free? You know, does it exist anywhere else? Um, in Iceland, as an example, a case study, um, Iceland leverage, leverages their natural resources of geothermal energy and gives it away for free, literally, um, to promote itself to large corporations. Uh, for, um, to sustain their, a large part of their economy. They've attracted the, uh, a, a large part of the aluminum industry in Iceland. Um, the aluminum industry uh, accounts for something like 3% of all the electricity that gets used in the world, all of it. And what, um, what the aluminum industry gains, first of all, basically free energy, it's emission-free energy as well. Uh, Vancouver uh, leverages free labor. Um, they essentially have created themselves, molded themselves into the so-called Hollywood of the North, and they um, simply by allow, kind of promoting the idea of uh, 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 labor assistance. So the idea also starts to think about free water districts uh, around the Great Lake, distributing this network throughout. They would be essentially these um, uh, delineated areas within uh, the cities uh, in the Great Lakes, and these are the kind of simple rules that we thought about, uh, one through six. So basically, take what you need as an industry, uh, use it, but then you have to clean it uh, in the architecture itself, essentially clean it back to fresh water, uh, clean it more in a bioremediation wetland. Essentially, we need to clean up a lot of these post-industrial landscapes, and water is the engine to really clean up. Um, put it back into a bio street, an eco boulevard, essentially, and then put that water back. Here's a very typical um, post-industrial landscape in and around the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, it's striking that there is residential, uh, the green part, upper, upper, part of the, uh, upper part of the map, um, just right next to what is essentially a disused, um, uh, uh, very polluted, or at least somewhat polluted brownfield site. And so here's our kind of uh, immediate, overly immediate uh, project. So what are the, what are the phases? First phase, um, one sort of creates an infrastructure to support the water moving and being conveyed around the site. Uh, second phase is to create a public component, uh, both this kind of central public component and uh, keep, uh, it's very important to keep the lake uh, free and clear of public amenity in all cases, we think. Uh, this is maybe what that dot looks like a little bit closer up. Lots of different types of public program, uh, parking, all of the sort of normal things that one must have when proposing a kind of new little uh, economic district uh, within, a, within, a, within a part of a city. Um, we also propose to have uh, the center dot to be a uh, R&D zone, research and development zone, a kind of university zone. That's what it looks, uh, the pizza looks a little bit more clear there. Um, and then the industry just sort of shows up as uh, the project kind of moves along as it, as it goes through its phases. And then it kind of gets these cuts relative to site uh, as, it, as, it, as, it, as it gets created. Um, so, and here's what it might look like in the end. Um, you know, the, we're really interested uh, in, back to this idea of hybridity, of really imagining uh, architecture and landscape as the same component. Uh, landscape is a highly artificial, uh, pro any landscape that we touch is artificial. Uh, it, it, it just is. And so we think that 
Uh, we need to kind of understand, though, how to create an artificial landscape that works with the ecological processes because we need the landscape to move water and people around simultaneously. Uh, so the uh, uh, district might look like this, where the buildings uh, and landscape and infrastructure collaborate to move water around the system. Uh, here's just a model that we're just right now making uh, to look at it a little bit more closely and how it might, uh, the scale and how it really might function. Um, this is the idea of the R&D university, uh, the buildings really merging programmatically with the landscape. Um, and then the exterior zone, this kind of peripheral zone, being this industrially ecological system where the lip that, moved, that, that is lifted uh, becomes um, a depository for all of the uh, goods that are waste, essentially, through any kind of um, uh, industrial process being collected and then being moved over to somebody else who can use that waste as resource. And then lastly, uh, the idea of, a, um, uh, uh, of the free water districts working with the um, entire kind of uh, urban and agricultural system within the Great Lakes uh, subcontinental, subcontinental Divide system. Okay. Um, I'm going to take three more minutes, if that's okay, and because uh, I just wanted to show one piece of architecture just to ground this somehow. Um, and I'm not going to take long, but uh, this is um, a project called Live Work Recycled Mound. Uh, we essentially um, uh, uh, um, uh, showed up at, a, at this project, and there was an existing store. We demoed this store, and because of zoning, this is in a, on a commercially zoned street where, we, uh, where one can't build a residential uh, residential units. They have to be at least above the first floor, the ground floor. We uh, um, collected all of the non-organic debris and created a landscape on the site so that the site lifted up to the building. Um, so here's a kind of uh, 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 summary of the different components. And I'm just going to kind of move through pretty quickly here. Um, on the first floor is an office, the, the work part. On the top floor is the live part. Um, about 20 million people in the United States both live and work in the same exact space. Uh, I think live-work spaces in general are highly um, under-conceptualized uh, by us, by architects, and uh, by, the, finan by fi uh, the financing system and insurance system. It's, uh, people don't, uh, it, well, not going to get into, the, into that part of it, but uh, let's just say that I think that there's a lot of uh, uh, design and policy issues related that can really allow people to live and work in the same place much more uh, healthfully and effectively uh, as, they, as, they, as they go along. I wanted to show you this kind of prefab component of this project. Uh, the entire upper floor is basically a truss. Uh, the, these um, pieces are 60 feet by about 14 feet. They were assembled off, they were made off site, brought on site and assembled in a day. Um, the way that the program on the top floor works is that the, everything is cantil it's cantilevered in four directions. On the two sides here uh, are all of the support program, program like the kitchen, bookshelves, closets, and so forth. Uh, here's a model of the uh, uh, proposed. Here it is a little bit further in, under construction. Uh, uh, here's some of the programmatic space, for instance, the bookshelf on the top floor. Here's where we were consolidating all of the debris from the uh, decommissioning of the uh, um, of the initial building. This is all the stuff that just could not be recycled for one reason or the other. Everything that could be recycled was, and um, all of the kind of uh, stuff that was left over, and it's enormous. We just didn't want to send to a landfill somewhere else. Uh, here is the prairie mound. Uh, prairie plants, as you might know, but probably maybe not, um, have these enormous root systems. Uh, prairie landscapes only exist basically in the Midwest for the most part, or that's where they primarily are. Um, the, prairie land, the prairie landscape system sequesters approximately six times more car uh, carbon in the air than does rainforests. It's incredibly productive because of these deep root systems. Um, and because the way that uh, the prairie landscapes are set up is that these root systems are essentially di infiltration diagrams. They allow water to percolate into the ground and to hold on to water even in the toughest uh, times, which because of climate change, we're going to only have more and more of. Um, and what this mound is doing is, first of all, holding the mound in place so that this debris becomes a, a kind of unit 
unto itself, a, a structural unit, but also moves water around the site. So the, all of the water hitting the site and the building uh, that, that can moves through into the, into the landscape, onto, well, onto the green roof, into the landscape, and we keep it on the site. And here's the parking surface that essentially operates as the uh, water sequestration area. Uh, green roof, here's the main, the one pipe inside of the first floor building where all of the water comes off the building and goes into the basement to be caught. Uh, here's a, a front elevation of it, and I am going to finish up. Oh, uh, one quick note. Uh, in this live-work concept, uh, we think it's really important to have a door and a separation, an outside separation between live and work. Uh, uh, for so many people, they work on their living room table with their family, and it's just impossible. All right. And uh, thank you very much. I'm going to hand it over to Michelle.